Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the eighth talk of this cycle of conferences entitled Chemistry and a, and a Hand Outreach to Society. Our speaker today is Maria Gamella from the Analytical Chemistry Department, and the title of the talk is Sense and Act Systems from Biomarker Detection to Responsive Release. As I usual, uh, usually mention uh, when I introduce these talks, uh, we have chosen the online format instead of face-to-face, -face, taking advantage of the platform provided by the General Foundation of the UCM, to whom I want uh, to thank the help and support to organize this activity. We thank also to our finding sources, the Spanish Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Society, the Royal Chemistry Society, Sectorial of Madrid, and Vice Rector for Research and Transfer for the financial support, because this enables us to use this format and this way many more people can be connected. Our junior researchers who have been investigated different aspects of the chemistry and biochemistry return to our institution after spending a long period abroad. One of the reasons we organize these webinars in English is because they are very familiar with the use of English to report their scientific results. In this way, we can broaden our audience to foreign institutions, some of which have been the host institutions for these researchers. The lectures take place on Thursday at 12.30 and they, continue, uh, they will continue until December 9th. They will be announced every week included the link to the registration form. Moreover, during the talk, I will include in the chat the link of the, of the uh, 9th of November 18th. For the students uh, who have been enrolled for credits in this activity, they should email um, at the address that I will include also in the chat. Without further ado, I give the turn to the moderator of this talk, Susana Campuzano, assistant professor of the same department, who will introduce the speaker. She also will moderate the discussion at the end of the talk and ask the speaker those questions that you can write in the preguntas and respuestas button that you have in the lower side of your screen. Now, Susana, when you want, it's your turn. Good morning to all. Thank you very much, Maite, for this great initiative and all your work and those of many other people involved in the organization of these fantastic seminars. I'm really happy to introduce you all today to Dr. Maria Gamella. She received her PhD in analytical chemistry in, 10, in 2010 at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. After working for a while as a postdoc at the same university, she moved to the United States, where she works as an associate researcher during five years from 10, uh, 2013 to 2018 in the laboratory of bioelectronics and bionanotechnology at Glasgow University headed by Professor Eugenie Katt. We were fortunate that she was then able to rejoin us again. And currently she works as an assistant professor at the analytical chemistry department of the chemistry faculty of UCM, where she also belongs to the electroanalysis and electrochemical biosensor research group. Her current research interests focus on the development of electroanalytical bioplatform, mostly immuno and genosensors for the determination of biomarkers of relevance in clinical diagnosis and food analysis. I will just tell you that she is an excellent researcher and an excellent person, and I am sure you will love what she is going to tell us today. Please go ahead, Maria. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susana, for your kind introduction and your continuous support. And I also would like to thank Professor Maite Villalba for organizing this interesting conference series because I know that it's a lot of work and she always is, takes care that everything goes well. And also would like to thank her for inviting me to give this uh, seminar. Uh, during this seminar, I'm gonna be talking about a little bit about the sense, sensing and actuator systems that we have developed during these years. What is then a sense and act system? Well, we can think of as the analogy, an analogy of connector connecting a printer to a computer. The computer uh, processes the information and the printer generates the output depending on the information we get from the computer. If we think of the clinical field, a sense and actuator system can be described as a closed loop system control 
that includes the sensor unit that responds to an input uh, in a closed loop system, along with the data processor and the actuator unit. This combination enables the cor an, a corrective action if needed in the presence depending on the uh, response get from the sensor. In this context, the sensor is able to measure the physical chemical changes, converts them into signals, and then these signals are read by the instrument, whereas the actuator is able to take the energy produced in this process and transform it into uh, energy or motion. More precisely, we have developed sense and actuator systems based on the use of biosensors as sensing units, what we call biosensing units, coupled with uh, what we call releasing units as actuating systems. That allows us to release the drug in the appropriate dosage. These changes that can be measured in the uh, body chemistry of each specific person offers a great opportunity to deliver personalized med culture. Now that we know a little bit about these sense and act systems, I wanted to summarize on this slide the main topics of my talk. Since our sense and act systems are composed of the biosensing unit that mainly is based on electrochemical biosensors and our actuator units, that we have called releasing units are going to be made of two different uh, materials, such as alginate hydrogels and pH responsive polymers. Let's start then by defining what a biosensor is. Well, a biosensor is a device that measures uh, molecules that are present in uh, body fluids that are called biomarkers. That biomarkers, these biomarkers inform us about the development and the stage of a specific disease. A biosensor is, uh, consists of the combination of these three magic components. The first one is the bio uh, recognition element, bioreceptor, that allows us to classify the biosensors depending on the kind of bioreceptor that we use. So we can use uh, uh, different kinds of bioreceptors, such as cells, antibodies, nucleic acids, enzymes, and so on. The next part of the biosensor is the signal generator or transducer that also allows us to classify the biosensor depending on the signal that we can get from the, uh, from the bioreceptor unit. And finally, the last part is the signal. How, what happens, what's going on inside this biosensor? Well, our bioreceptor is immobilized on the surface of the transducer and it recognizes specifically one analyte present in our sample. This recognition process leads to a reaction that generates a signal. This signal is uh, collected by the transducer. Depending on the signal that is generated, it can be a pH change or current difference or mass change, etc. We are gonna have a different transducer. That is going to, as I just already said, is going to collect the signal produced in this biorecognition process and then it's going to translate it into an electric signal. This electric signal is going to get uh, collected by the detector that is going to uh, translate and amplify it into a, a useful signal, useful information for the, for the user. Mm -hmm. Well, if we can classify the biosensor depending on the transducer, an electrochemical biosensor is just a kind of biosensor that uses electro electrochemical transducers that are usually called electrodes. The excellent feature offered by these electrochemical biosensors, such as their simplicity and affordable cost, the, the fact that they require low time of, of analysis to be performed, the analysis, and the possibility of carrying out multiplex and multi-omics analysis make these devices very uh, good, uh, very interesting tools for the development of point-of-care devices. There are many electrochemical transducers that are also called electro that we can use to develop these biosensors, ranging from the conventional metallic electrode and going through the most recent developed paper-based and flexible electrode along with the disposable electrode that allows us to develop implantable and wearable devices 
And also we can find electrode arrays that allows us to carry out this multiplex analysis that I, I told you before in a very easy way. The number of publication regarding electrochemical biosensors has increased exponentially during these last 20 years. And is estimated, the analytical world market is estimated, estimated to be $80,000 million a year, of which 30% comes from the medical health, uh, care area. However, there is still um, great expansion of potential for this market since only 1% of, uh, of this market uses biosensors. There are many kinds of biosensors, but I wanted to bring up your attention to the most uh, common and uh, used electrochemical biosensors in the world since 6% of world uh, population is uh, are diabetic. It's a glucometer or, gluco, uh, or blood glucose test. This is a simple test in which the patient just needs to prick his her finger and drop a little, a little drop or, of drop on the test strip. On the surface of this test strip, there's mobilized an enzyme that is, called, uh, that is called glucose oxidase that is able to react with glucose. And, and in this reaction, a uh, change in current is produced that is measured and amplified by the reader that gives the concentration of glucose in blood to the patient. Now that we know what a biosensor is, let's, let's uh, explain a little bit about the releasing units that we have used. As a reminder, uh, a releasing unit, what we have called an actuator unit, accepts commands to perform an action. In this sense, we have used extremely responsive materials to uh, develop our uh, actuating units since these materials are able in the first place to entrap different kinds of drugs or molecules that we want to release. And also these uh, materials allows us to release this uh, drug depending on the external, on the application of, a, of an external input. We have used two different materials to develop our releasing units that are alginate hydrogels and switchable polymeric materials. Alginate hydrogels are well, actually not alginate, are alginate is a naturally anionic uh, polymer that is produced from, uh, from uh, brown uh, seaweed. And it has been used in many applications such as food industry, cosmetics, uh, textiles, and pharmaceutical applications, among others. I'm sure that everybody has gone to these uh, wonderful frozen yogurt places where you pick your ice cream and you put on top of it a lot of uh, toppings. And I'm sure you have seen your, uh, you have seen these uh, colorful like beads that you just eat them and splash them in your mouth. They are usually made of arginate. So in this context, arginate is particularly interesting for medical applications due to its low toxicity and biodegradability at physiological conditions. Also allows us to entrap a great variety of biomolecules, uh, hydrophobic as well as hydrophilic, and it presents a great mechanical and adhesive properties. It's possible to encapsulate a great variety of molecules, but the most important thing is that it's possible the, these, uh, these molecules maintain and keep the biological activity inside the hydrogen. It's very easy to prepare these feeds because you just need to prepare a solution of alginate with the drug that you want to entrap in it and add a multi, uh, multi, um, multivalent cation, usually divalent cations such as calcium or barium. Specifically, calcium crosslink alginate has been used for the non control continuous slow release also called leakage of the different uh, molecules in pharmaceutical applications. However, we didn't want to have this uncontrolled release. We wanted to control the release. In order to achieve this trigger signal release, we prepare a special kind of uh, um, uh, alginate hydrogels uh, using uh, iron as crosslink. 
these iron cross-link uh, uh, alginate hydrogels present an advantage over the calcium hydrogels because it's possible to control the formation of the gel and the dissolution depending on the uh, oxidation state of the iron. If you take a look at the picture on the screen, if we prepare a solution of alginate in the presence of iron plus three, the uh, solution immediately becomes a gel, it becomes gelified. But if we reduce this iron plus three nitrate into iron plus two, the uh, gel gets dissolved with the subsequent release of the of the drug that we had to trap in it, in a very easy way, but just applying a potential. It is also important to note here that we can control the shape and the thickness of the alginate layer. And it's very important because of that, we can control the amount of drug that we want to release. It's very easy to prepare the beads, as, as I have already said. You just need to prepare the solution of alginate and add iron plus three, and these uh, beads are gonna, uh, are gonna appear. But what happens if we prepare a solution of, iron, uh, of alginate in the presence of iron plus two? The solution is still not jellyfied. But if we introduce an electrode and apply a positive potential in order to oxidize this iron plus two, an alginate layer is gonna uh, form on the surface of the electrode. Therefore, depending on the shape of the electrode, we can control the shape of the alginate layer. Additionally, additionally since we can control the thickness, uh, we can control the time during we apply the potential, we can control the thickness of the layer. Now that we know about alginate hydrogels and electrochemical biosensors, let's see how can we combine both to prepare to make this sense in an actuator system. And the first example that I want to explain uh, presents like antibacterial properties. Let's have a look first at the biosensing unit that we prepare. We modified a graphite electrode with a mixed monolayer of uh, uh, pyrrolorokinone in quinone, PQQ, that, that is a redox mediator that oxidizes NADH into NAD+. And also we mobilized in this layer an antibody against E. coli. Additionally, we prepare this conjugates through the mobilization of the same anti-E. coli antibody and this protein that is an enzyme called glucosehydrogenase that, as you can see on, this, uh, on the left uh, part of the slide, reacts with glucose in the presence of NADH, NAD+. What happens if we don't have E. coli in the solution? Well, we, we are not gonna have GDH uh, bound to the surface of the electrode, therefore there's no NADH production on the surface and there's no movement, there's no oxidation and no uh, electron movement into it. Therefore, when we measure the potential within time, we could see no difference no shift in the potential regarding the, uh, the zero time and our system is open. What happens now if we add E. coli into the solution? Well, E. coli gets uh, it's, uh, recognized by the antibody bound to the surface of the electrode. And at the same time, it's gonna be recognized by the immunoconjugate that we prepare. Now, TTH is bound to the surface of the electrode and starts consuming glucose and NAD+, NAD to produce NADH, which enters in a cascade with PQQ and gets, again, oxidized with the subsequent uh, production of electrodes, which is translated in uh, shift, negatively shifting the potential measure and our system is on, or can be potentially on. We took advantage of these uh, by sensing unit of this potential to prepare our sensing and actuator system. We connected the biosensing electrode to a second electrode modified with this iron plus three alginate hydrogel, which had to trap an antibacterial drug in it. When E. coli is present in the sample, the oxidation of NADH uh, takes place with the subsequent uh, movement of electrodes from the biosensing unit to the actuating units that allows the reduction, reduction of iron plus three to iron plus two, 
with a subsequent release of the drug that killed the bacteria, as you can see on the uh, image of the petri dish on the slide. This is a very interesting uh, system because it's possible to detect and to kill bacteria at the same time. In a second approximation of the sensing and activating units, we also prepare two different electrodes and we connect by sensing units and the electrode modified with an alginate uh, crosslink uh, layer. Let's bring up this uh, analogy. Imagine that you are inside a room and there are a lot of people with you inside the room and only one door. Imagine that all the people, most of the people are close to that door and suddenly a waiter comes with a food. Who is going to eat the food? The, the people who are close to the door and if you're lucky, you're going to eat something. So based on this analogy, we prepare our biosensing unit. We modify a paper-based electrode with the first layer of proteins. On top of this first layer of proteins, we uh, prepare different conjugates to mobilize the second layer of proteins, which was more compact than the first one. And as well, it's important to say that these both proteins are able to react with the same, uh, with the same signal. What happens now if we apply a signal? Well, the first layer of proteins uh, are gonna is uh, gonna eat, are gonna react with the signal, and none of the signal of the uh, signal is gonna get to the surface of the electrode. It's gonna get intercepted. Therefore, there's no oxidation, no movement of electrodes. The iron plus three doesn't get reduced, and there's no release. Our system is off. What happens now if we add an input? More waiters are coming. People are gonna move from the first tray to the second and then to the third. So the first one maybe have space and you can eat the food. It's the same concept. If we apply an input able to break this first, second layer of proteins and we apply now a signal, part of this signal is gonna reach the first layer of proteins as well. With the subsequent production of electrons on the surface of this electrode, that is that are gonna reach the uh, iron plus C alginate, reducing the iron plus two, sorry, the iron plus three to iron plus two, with the subsequent dissolution of the electrode and the release, the release of our track. Therefore, our system is on. Based on this mechanism, we have developed several uh, sense and act systems, but I wanted to bring up the system because it's able to release insulin just in uh, case of a health condition such as diabetic ketoacidosis. This ketoacidosis is a complication producing patients with diabetes. Uh, uh, with diabetic, the diabetes that uh, happens when your body produces a high, le high levels of body uh, body acid, acids called uh, ketone bodies, due to a surge a surge of uh, insulin in the body production the, in the body. These are the main ketone bodies produced, but we decided we focus on the detection of this beta hydroxybutyric acid or 3 hydroxybutyric acid. Therefore, our uh, sensing and actuator system was composed as well as the previous one by two units. The biosensing unit, unit that is able to detect this 3 hydroxybutyric acid and the releasing unit that is uh, that consists of a graphite electrode modified with uh, a layer of uh, a Iron plus three alginate, which had entrapped insulin in it. To prepare the biosensing unit, we modified a paper uh, electrode with first layer of protein that is PQQ glucose dehydrogenase. On the second layer, we immobilized what we call wrong antigen that is two hydroxybutyric acid. Remember that I said that we were gonna, we wanted to detect three hydroxybutyric acid. And I'm gonna explain later on why this is important. And we also prepare a second layer 
of uh, sorry, a third layer of, uh, of proteins by immobilizing on silicon nanoparticles and antibody against three hydroxybutyric acid and glucose oxidase that is also able, as well as PQQ UTH, of, uh, react of reacting with glucose. What happens when we have, when we don't have uh, two, uh, three hydroxybutyric acids acid in the solution? When we have, we always have glucose in the serum. So since uh, all the glucose are gonna get uh, I'm gonna react with this glucose oxidase and it's not gonna get through, go and not gonna get through and, and reach the surface of the electrode. Therefore, there's no insulin release, at least control release. We measure, as a proof as to prove that, that we measure the uh, the parametric uh, signals for this system in the absence as in and, and in the presence of, of glucose. And as you can see, there was no uh, electrochemical signal, uh, neither in the absence nor in the presence of glucose. What happens now if we add the correct input, the uh, uh, three hydroxyl butyric acid? Both are similar in structure, and this antibody is specific, uh, specific for these three hydroxyl butyric acid, but still, due to their similarity, it's going to recognize two hydroxybutyric acid, but in a weaker way. Therefore, when we add this input, the three hydroxybutyric acid, a competition is established between these two both antigens, and therefore, the uh, conjugate gets removed from the surface of the electrode. Now, glucose can reach the surface of the electrode, producing the oxidation of glucose, and with the subsequent uh, movement of electrons that is translated in the controlled insulin release. We also measure the voltamperometric uh, signals for this system in the absence and in the presence of glucose. And as you can see, now we, we can see, really, we can see the consumption of glucose on the surface of the edge. Let's move on now to uh, explain a little bit about the other kind of sensing and uh, actuating units that we have developed based on switchable polymers. These switchable interfaces can be analogous. I could say, imagine that when you are cold and suddenly you get uh, goosebumps and your hair skin gets on the end. And then whenever you feel again the warmth, your skin becomes at the same, the same at the beginning. Well, these switchable interfaces are similar to this analogy because response to a signal and in response to that signal, they are able to change the, the, the state, to change the form of the, of the surface. We took advantage of these um, surfaces in order to track and uh, to uh, load and release our track depending on the uh, transition uh, transition of the of the material therefore switching on and off our system these tunable surfaces can be controlled by different kinds of external signals such as magnetic field light temperature ph and so on we specifically used ph uh, uh, switchable interfaces we modified electrodes with two different kinds of polymers, uh, making what we call polymeric brushes. These polymers present different structure depending, different charge, depending on the pH, therefore they present different charge at different pHs. The tool that we used to change this pH was the application of a negative potential. This negative potential produces a reduction in the oxygen in the media. That is, you can, that is, you can, as you can see on the slide, this reaction consumes the protons of the solution. Therefore, it produces the increase in the pH of the solution. How it works? Okay, imagine that we have our electrode modified with two polymers, but a pH. 
and one of them is positively charged. The other is neutral, so it has different different shapes. We can just immobilize a negatively uh, charged drug, for example, as a proof of concept DNA. DNA is always negatively charged. When we add DNA in the solution, it's going to get a trap trapped in the surface of the electrode because this electric, electro, electrical attraction. What happens now if we apply this potential? When we apply a potential, the proton, the oxygen is uh, reduced and then the pH changes, at least on the surface, on the electrode, close to the surface of the electrode, becoming a little bit more basic. This change in pH is translated into a change in the surface because the one, the polymer that was positively charged now becomes neutral, and the one that was neutral now becomes negatively charged with the subsequent release of our negatively charged drug in a controlled way. We developed several systems based on this uh, mechanism, but I wanted to uh, highlight this application in which we prepare a uh, uh, Switchable interface on flexible electrodes that would compose of these two com of these two uh, of these two substances, the boronic acid and uh, this uh, amino amino uh, compound. This is interesting because this surface is uh, positively charged at pH seven, which means that we can work with this system in physiological conditions. In, if we apply a pH change, then the bronic acid becomes negatively charged and we can release in a controlled way our drug. As a proof of concept, we uh, immobilized. First, we loaded our electrode with a DNA negatively charged, labeled with a fluorescent dye. And we took the confocal image of that surface. Of course, as you can see, coming from this green light, we were able to mobilize the DNA in the surface of the electrode. When we apply potential, we, we decrease the pH and we were able to release the DNA. Since, as we can see on the uh, second uh, confocal image taken after the application of the pH, since it's completely black now, we don't have any DNA left on the surface. Taking advantage of this, we perform the uh, insulin, the insulin released in human serum based on the same concept. We first load it since insulin is negatively charged at pH 7. And after loading it, we were able to release by uh, increasing the pH by just applying potential. Uh, in collaboration with the University of Missouri, we were able to implant these electrodes on, uh, on diabetic mice. As of now, we just apply negative potential to change the pH of the solution, but there is a possibility of change this pH to combine and by another by using another means in order to combine uh, the biosensor and the, the polymers to generate this uh, sensing and actuator system. It can be that we have two electrodes with two different enzymes in which uh, it, uh, a cascade is produced using different inputs and outputs. Imagine now that we have our system with two enzymes and in a pH seven, and we have immobilized somehow our system where was negatively charged at this pH with the drug loaded inside. What happens if we apply an input now? Then our first enzyme starts working and produce an, an output X, let's say. The electrons start flowing from one electrode to the other producing a change in the second electrode that allows the second enzyme to consume protons and therefore changing the pH with the subsequent release of our trap from the surface of the electrode in a controlled way. To conclude this talk, I would like to highlight that even though our prototypes are only for of, uh, proof of concept demonstration, it's possible to develop, it can be possible to develop autonomous systems that not only in the diagnostic for the diagnostic, diagnostic approach, but it can be easily translated into other areas such as food uh, industry. 
our uh, platforms present a great versatility since it's possible to use them in a biological environment. Therefore, they are promising for the development of implantable bioelectronical devices that can operate that can operate in vivo and also can respond to a multiple kind of biomarkers. We think that it's possible that in the future, these devices can lead to the development of autonomous remote control point of care devices that allows home personalized medical care for the patient. Finally, I would like to thank the people from the group of electroanalysis and biosensores electrochemicals from this university, currently, currently headed by Professor Susana Campuzano, and the people from the Laboratory of Bioelectronics and Bionanotechnology from Clarkson University, headed by Professor Eugene Katz. Thank you very much for your all time support and your, uh, uh, your support during this during these years. And finally, I would like to thank everybody that is listening to me today. And now I'm open to all the questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, for this wonderful presentation. I think it was really instructive for all of us and really fascinating. Uh, I think I don't see any open question yet, but probably because the people are shy, then I will, I will start with one very general question. Um, I mean, uh, from your broad expertise and knowledge in this system, what do you think is more challenging to develop the releasing, the biosensing unit or the integration? Uh, probably the most difficult is the integration of both parts. Uh, and also, uh, I could say also the integration, but a little bit the releasing unit because it has to be stable the biological conditions and it's not that easy. But it can be challenging both, but probably most challenging is the releasing unit. The releasing unit. But probably because you are you have expertise, a lot of expertise in biosensing, then yes. most likely yes. <laughs> okay. And if I allow another question, what are, do you think that are the main limitations for currently from this system to, to, to see? In the market. In the market. Yeah, I, I suppose that we need a lot of time, like all the other research, but for you, what is the step forward? The step forward is uh, first of all, it's kind of uh, it's not that easy to find this combination of systems because there are many biomarkers, but not all of them respond to um, a drug that, are, that is able to activate the activate this uh, yeah. releasing unit. So the main challenge is like kind of generating new materials that are, that are responsive and allows us to release these drugs in a controlled way depending on, this, on, the, on the input given by the sensor. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, I guess we have to do a lot of uh, medical trials for especially the, the implantation of the biosensing units. Uh, make them more compatible with the with the human. Well, still, we have a lot of, a lot of lot work. work to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. this, is, this is really wonderful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question, if it's possible. I mean, uh -huh. uh, it's a very gen general question, but I, I think that uh, if you are handling this kind of proteins, I mean, it's protein struct the, the the protein structure is very important in this to preserve and. And um, and I want to know which is the the, the techniques that you use to, to be sure, I mean, to prove that this uh, structure is maintained uh, during all the process that you have in this, uh, the preparation of these devices. Uh, how you, how mean, you control the, the integrity of the protein? Do you mean in both units or just yeah. in the releasing unit? Um, I see that I see that in release unit. Release unit. Uh, I mean, it's well studied now that the alginate can trap different uh, molecules, and there's no problem with uh, with the stability of these proteins. But in the case that we have used proteins to that, for example, when we released insulin, we coupled this. We, we didn't do it normally, but we took a sample and analyzed it with mass mass spec. Uh, we checked that the, the the protein was was still okay. It was no problem. And uh, regarding DNA, I didn't say anything here, but we used the DNA 
that and this DNA that was released was used in another cascade. And we proved that the DNA was okay because this cascade was working. It was a DNA sign that was perfectly working. So in that case, we didn't check it, but it, it, is, it works. So and it's well known that alginate can attract pretty well these molecules because it's been used in pharmaceutical applications, many applications in that. Yeah, but if, for instance, if you have a, a, a protein, a, a native protein, and we do, you, you usually test up before and after, encapsulate the protein to try to mm -hmm. see if maybe we saw some kind of uh, antibody uh, interaction or whatever, and recognition. I mean, you, you, you do this kind of experiments? We... Because we, I see that the mass spectrometry is okay, but mass spectrometry yeah, yeah, only registered uh, peptides, I think, I and, and you cannot be sure that the integrity of the protein is correct. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you um, if you can, for instance, yes. encapsulate the protein yes. and to try to see when you release the protein, if the protein is, is recognized mm -hmm. by the antibody mm -hmm. the same way that before. We, we tried just before, after we didn't try. Okay. I'm sure it, it is stable and it works. Okay. And I have another question about biosensors in general. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to know which is the, the real advantages of this uh, electrochemical biosensor if you compare with uh, the optical biosensor, or the mass sensitive biosensor that maybe we used, uh, you know, uh, more generally used. In, uh, in this kind of, uh, of detection uh, analysis. Okay, I mean, to me, the most important thing about these electrochemical biosensors is the, 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 um, the instrumentation because it's cheaper, okay. cheaper than the optical ones. And actually it can be also miniaturizable in, in like a small, there like, uh, you see the glucometer is a small device that is electrochemical. So it's easier to um, miniaturize this instrumentation than the optical one. It, I don't know if it's possible or not because I'm not engineering. Maybe it's possible to miniaturize uh, the license with readers, so I'm not sure. But the main advantage of that is the the the, the portability, the possibility the, the possibility of make these devices portable, and it's also a little bit cheaper instrumentation. I don't know if sí. there are more questions. If you have another question, Susana. I have another general, but it's just a curiosity, Maria. Between both the uh, releasing units that you have explained us, what is your favorite? You think are more versatile alginate, polymers, depend on the application, or because alginate is fantastic. And, uh, and I, 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 I like very much, especially the, the approach that you have shown that the alginate is put on the electrode surface. Mm -hmm. to cover with a small, this is a, a, an important advantage of using electrochemical biosensor in this mm -hmm. case, for example, that we can control the thickness and the, 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 of the field. But what do you think in your, in your opinion? To me, it's easier to use the alginate, but mm -hmm. because the polymeric process are more complicated because there are not many polymers that allow you to uh, to track and release the system in uh, biological conditions. Mm -hmm. And as well, it's kind of, uh, I would say, difficult to, to find an stimulant, an external stimulant that can allow you to, con to release in a controlled way. It's easier with the alginate because also, it, to me, it's easier. From my experience, it was easier for me to, for us, see, like finding different uh, systems based on the use of alginate mm -hmm. than the uh, polymeric process. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. I don't think, uh, I have no more. I, I have another question, yeah. Maria. <laughs> Which is the material of the paper? I mean, the paper. I understand this paper, but which which kind of uh, of paper do you uh, there are, there are in this kind of electrodes? Mm -hmm. We use what we call bucket paper electrode that is made of uh, carbon nanotubes, like compressed ah, carbon okay. nanotubes. Then this is a cheap a cheap material. It is kind of cheap, yes. Okay. <laughs> cheap, yeah. Good. 
Well, I don't know if if there are not more questions, we can. I mean, after this nice, nice talk, it was a very nice, nice talk, very clear and very nice talk. And I suppose that maybe a lot of people can uh, ask you to collaborate because, uh, I mean, this uh, open, a very uh, promising uh, future for the detection of many things. I mean, foods or, or release uh, drugs or whatever. I think that it's a very interesting topic. Uh, well, I only encourage students and professors to attend the next talk <laughs> <laughs> on November 18th. Jesus Prado from the Inorganic Chemistry Department is going to talk. And uh, well, so see you next Thursday, everybody. And thank you again, Susana and Maria, for this nice talk. Thank you. Then, thank you, Maria. See you next see Thursday. You. Bye. 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 Bye.